Flemings, Memorial University, can you tell us about those complexities and problems? Albert. Um, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about uh, related to that. So um, you know how how we can use like resolution proofs in order to analyze SAT solvers. We're going to talk about using different proof systems to analyze different algorithms. Be sort of related to SAT here. Um, yeah. Okay. So integer programming problem. Um, you're given as input a system of linear inequalities. Um, these form a polytope in n-dimensional space, just like take the intersection of all the uh, points that satisfy the linear inequalities. And this gives you this big convex object with flat sides. Um, and you're also given a direction. And this is sort of the direction you want to optimize in. Um, and you want to output an integer point which maximizes in this direction. So in particular, it's really important that we want to output an integer point here. Um, so this would be a solution, this little star guy here. That's the optimal solution in this direction. Um, and this is a, a super general framework. Like it's very easy to encode most NP hard problems as integer programs. And so, you know, if we can, yeah, it's NP hard to solve. Um, you, so you should contrast this with linear programming, which is like, uh, P complete basically. Um, so in linear programming, we want to output rather than just outputting an integer solution here. In linear programming, we just want to output any solution in the polytope. So the, for integer programming, this is the solution. And for linear programming, it's the one furthest on the polytope in this direction. Okay. Um, yeah. So even though integer programming is NP hard um, or NP complete, actually. Um, just like in SAT, uh, practitioners are able to solve uh, practical instances of integer programming pretty routinely. Uh, so how is this done? Um, the general idea for all of these algorithms is to reduce from uh, integer programming to linear programming. Um, so the, for this, we're going to need this notion of an integer hull of a polytope. Uh, so the integer hull is like, um, uh, you look at all of the integer points that are contained in the polytope and you take the convex hull of them. So the smallest convex body uh, that contains all of the integer points. And now, as you can see, the vertices of this polytope are the integer points that are in this, in the initial polytope. Um, yeah, this is a polytope. Uh, and since the vertices of the integer hull are the integer solutions, if we run linear programming, um, on the integer hull, we get an integer solution. So uh, this is a reduction from uh, integer programming to linear programming. So if there's a way to take a general polytope and reduce it to its integer hull, then we can just run linear programming on it and get an integer solution and solve integer linear programming. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can see that that's the solution. Um, yeah, so what modern integer programming algorithms try to do is to do this reduction, to turn a polytope into its integer hull. Um, and so one way to do this uh, was suggested by Gamor and Vital in the, in the 70s and 60s. Um, was, this was to add cutting planes to this polytope. Um, so what's a cutting plane? So basically, it's a linear inequality that lies outside of, its, outside of the polytope. So it's every point in the polytope satisfies this linear inequality. Um, and we're going to require that the, the coefficients of the linear inequality are relatively prime. Um, and the right hand side is rational. And what we can derive from this is, um, yeah, the, uh, you, you can derive AX gradient with the ceiling of B. You can round up the right hand side. And this is just because if you had any integer point which satisfied AX gradient with a B, uh, then since the, the, the coefficients A are integer, um, then any solution is going to, any integer solution will also satisfy AX gradient with the ceiling of B. So just remove the fractional part. Yep. So it's not that if they're not relatively prime, this isn't valid. It's just that it's not optimal if they're not relatively prime. So yes, yeah, so the relatively, relatively prime part, we can ignore that, but it gives you this really nice property. Um, uh, it, it explains kind of what's happening geometrically. Um, so if A is relatively prime, um, 
then what happens is you take, so this is AX variant with a B here. Um, and what a CG cut is, is taking this inequality and just shifting it upward to the nearest integer point. This, this only happens if they're relatively prime. So it's like the, as Russell was saying, just the basically the optimal thing you can do with these cuts. There. So this is what happens. You, know, you shave off corners of the polytope. And you should think of these, um, yeah, CG cuts as just cutting off corners of the polytope. And we want to keep doing this until eventually we get down to the end of the whole. Okay, so another example of that. Um, yeah. And so, um, it's slightly out of order actually, um, but uh, Vital showed that, you know, um, if we add enough cutting planes, then we are eventually going to converge to the integer whole. So this is like complete for doing this. However, uh, it may take a very, very long time. This was shown originally by Pudlock and Benet Patassin Raz for a restricted case. Um, another downside to this is that it's unfortunately numerically, like pretty numerically unstable and requires some uh, complicated heuristics to implement this cutting planes procedure. Okay, so what do modern uh, integer programming algorithms do? Well, most of them implement this thing called branch and cut. Um, and branch and cut combines these CG cuts, this, this cutting planes method, with a branch and bound procedure. So it's going to alternate doing the following two things. First is this branching procedure, where we take our polytope and we break it up into a bunch of subpolytopes. Um, the very <laughs> the general framework is we can just break them up however we want, uh, but we're going to restrict this later because um, uh, <coughs> algorithms don't do this arbitrarily. Uh, so branching, we take um, we start with our polytope P and we break it up into a bunch of subpolytopes such that every integer point is contained in one of the subpolytopes. So here's an example. Uh, there's P1, P2, P3. Um, and you can observe here, these are the three different polytopes we get, and all integer points are preserved. And then we're left with these three polytopes. Um, and then we do the second step, cut, hence the name branching cut. Um, so we refine each of these polytopes by including some additional CG cuts or cutting points. And we keep doing this over and over again until eventually we find an integer, integer solution or we run out of points and it's unsatisfying. Okay. Um, yeah, so here I gave you a very general definition of this branching, but in practice, branching is done by splitting on an arbitrary integer linear inequality. So we, we pick a linear form, AX, and we branch on whether it's greater than or equal to B or less than or equal to B minus, uh, B plus one, or yeah, B minus one, has. <laughs> same thing. Um, and we're going to require that A is integral and so is B. Okay. And in fact, like in branch, um, in, in practice, this is, this is maybe even overkill. Like what people will often do for this branching step is just like standard DPLL branching. Uh, and DPLL branching in this geometric setting corresponds to just picking a variable and branching on whether it's greater than or equal to one or less than or equal to zero. And, so on and so forth. So branching on the value of single variables, but uh, doing it with linear inequalities is much. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's how roughly how uh, practical integer programming algorithms work. Um, and so we want to analyze these. We want to understand like how good these algorithms are, what they can do. Um, so these modern integer programming algorithms are kind of a complicated mess of heuristics. They, they do this branching and cutting, but we need to choose how to branch and how to cut. And that's really, really difficult. <laughs> and because of these heuristics, it makes, and this is you know sim similar and sad as well, uh, it makes like directly analyzing these algorithms very difficult because we have to worry about like which heuristic we used here and here and here. Um, and that's kind of <laughs> becomes a little bit infeasible. Um, so instead we can turn to proof complexity. Um, so we can use the following observation, that if the polytope contained no integer points, so the polytope was unsatisfiable, um, then if we run the integer programming algorithm, um, then it has to, because the integer programming algorithm is deterministic, it has to, like its execution trace has to actually be a proof of the fact that the um, polytope contained 
no integer points. It has to output this thing. Like it has to say there's no integer po points in this polytope. Okay. And so the transcript of the algorithm, yeah, is a proof that there's no integer points in the polytope. And this also even works in the optimization case where, you know, if if we if the algorithm outputs that like some point X is the optimal thing, then it sort of includes a proof of the fact that there, there's no better solution. So this you can even use this idea to analyze optimization. Um, yeah, and so this leads to proof complexity. Um, so instead of trying to analyze the algorithm directly, we want to formalize the techniques that the algorithm uses into a proof system um, and then analyze that proof system. So in particular, lower bounds in the size of proofs in the corresponding proof system imply runtime lower bounds in the algorithm. Okay. Um, so this sort of uh, approach dates back uh, all the way back to Vital, uh, who started doing this with um, the, the cutting planes uh, proof system. So a cutting planes refutation of a polytope, which doesn't contain any integer points, uh, is just a sequence of polytopes uh, such that each polytope is obtained from a previous one by including a new uh, CG cut. And the size of the proof is just the number of polytopes in the sequence. So a little picture is here's the first polytope. We add a CG cut, we rule out those points. Another one, we rule out these points. Another one, we rule out the entire polytope. It's empty and the size of the proof was three. This is pictorially kind of what's going on. It's introduced by Vital. Um, again, the first lower bounds are proved by a Pudlock and the Nathan Hassan Bras for um, <coughs> the case where each CG cut has small coefficients. And we're going to get back to this small coefficients theme in a little bit. Um, yeah, and so this captures these uh, original cutting planes algorithms I mentioned that only use CG cuts, but no branching. Um, so in 2018, we introduced this proof system, um, stabbing planes, um, in order to model these branching cut solvers, in order to model the more uh, modern algorithms for integer programming. So a stabbing planes proof is extremely simple. Um, at each step, we pick an arbitrary integer linear inequality, so A and B are integral. Um, and we branch on whether that inequality is true or false over the integers. That is whether AX is less than or equal to B or AX is greater than or equal to B plus one. And then we recurse in the two polytopes. So here's an example. Uh, there's AX less than or equal to B and AX greater than or equal to B plus one. And we have this slab, this set of points that lie in between these two things. Uh, and this slab is removed every time we recurse. So just like how in cutting planes, we remove sides or like corners of the polytope. In stabbing planes, we're removing like midsections of the polytope. Um, because A and B are integral, this slab doesn't contain any integer points. And yeah, so we get two polytopes and we recurse on them. And we keep recursing until each, until we've derived, like each of these polytopes is empty, basically, until we've certified the fact that there's no integer points in them. Um, yeah. Don't shave uh, so you can, you, you, you can, and I'll, I will get back to that in a second. Um, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so a stabbing plane's refutation more formally uh, of a polytope with no integer points is just a binary tree where for each node, you have some linear form AX and uh, as two outgoing edges, one's labeled with AX grand equal to B plus one, the other one's less than equal to B. Um, and uh, we can associate with each node um, a polytope, which is formed by taking the intersection, uh, taking their initial polytope P and intersecting it with all the linear inequalities along that root to leaf branch. So for example, uh, here, you know, this is P, this is polytope P, and then we go down this branch, we intersect with AX grand equal to P plus one, and we get this polytope. So this is the polytope corresponding to this node and a, stabbing planes uh, refutation of P is one in which each of the leaves is labeled with the empty polytope. And this is like a sound proof system um, because if there was any integer points in the initial polytope, because every time we removed a slab, the slab doesn't contain any integer points in it. If we could have 
derive the empty polytope at each of the leaves, uh, then this is a proof of the fact that there wasn't any integer points to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, why are we taking the intersection of like ax greater than or equal to b plus one like we don't want to satisfy ax less than or equal to b right mm, yeah so i that. yeah so we're just picking some integer linear inequality and you should think of branching on whether the integer linear inequality is true or false okay. so uh, on, on this one this is corresponding to it being true right um, and this one's corresponding to it being false, roughly over over the integers. Okay. Um, how easy is to determine that you got empty? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah. So, so at the end, uh, we can just run a linear program at the end to check that the polytope that you have, like the intersection of everything down the path, um, actually does. Uh, doesn't have any points at all in it. Yeah. Or Farkas Lemma also works. Um, yeah. Okay. And the, the size of the proof is just going to be the number of nodes in there. This is polynomially related to the actual like bit complexity of writing down the proof. Oh, Cochrane notes that every time you. This is for the people attending on Zoom. So either like speak in the mic or repeat the question. Ah, okay. No, then I have any question. So, uh, how do you know that when you guess this inequality, you make progress? That you cut part of the polytope? Yeah, so that's a great question. Here, it's just like in like resolution proofs or like just sort of a non deterministic thing. Um, so the practical implement, the people that are, that are actually implementing these algorithms, they have to worry about that. But for me, I just care about like the existence of such a, a proof. I'm looking for the smallest such proof here. So yeah, you could do something that definitely doesn't make progress, but if they're, yeah, it's a worst case measure. Um, yeah, okay, so that was um, satin planes. And so it seems like cutting planes and statin planes capture different parts of these branch and cut integer programming algorithms. Cutting planes captures the actual cutting, well, uh, whereas stabbing planes captures the branching. Um, so you might think maybe they're uh, different. Uh, however, it's, it's not too difficult to see um, that, in fact, from the perspective of proof complexity, these, um, these cutting planes are kind of superfluous. You can turn any cutting planes proof of size s into a stabbing planes proof of roughly the same size. I think the blow ups by two or something like that. Um, and then this kind of goes back to Albert's question. Um, okay, uh, so actually I'll say that in a second. Um, yeah, so in order to do this, in order to prove this theorem, I'm actually gonna introduce a weaker notion of stabbing planes, which is gonna be equal to cutting planes. So the stabbing planes query, like one of these branches, um, we're gonna say is path-like if one of the two sides of the query is the empty polytope. Uh, so this is not a path-like query. Both this and this are not empty, uh, but this one is. So this whole side, there's nothing left here and we recurse on this side. And a path-like um, stabbing plants proof is one where every um, query is path-like and it just looks like one big long path because one side has to be empty. Okay. Uh, so it's not hard to see that path like stabbing planes is equal to cutting planes. Um, how do we see this? Uh, so if we have uh, some linear inequality here, uh, we take a CG cut, so we round up uh, the right hand side. Then we can just look at the stabbing planes branch, which is AX squared equal to the ceiling of B, AX less than the ceiling of B minus one. This is a valid stabbing planes branch, and so we can just simulate each stabbing points, each CG cut one at a time um, and get a path like stabbing points proof. Okay, so um, stabbing planes now seems pretty powerful. It can, it can do the branching, but it can also like sort of pretty trivially simulate these uh, cutting planes. So it might be natural to conjecture that cutting planes is, uh, is quite weak, uh, is a lot weaker than, uh, than stabbing planes. Uh, and this is what we did in, in 2018. Never trust our conjectures. Um, so we conjectured that the Cyton formulas are a separating example. Okay. 
Um, so the Saiton formulas, uh, you're given a graph with an odd number of vertices. Um, and it, it, the, the formula is going to assert that there's a way to assign edges to this graph um, such that each vertex has an odd number of uh, like incident edges or neighbors. Uh, so you write this down as a system of mod two linear equations like this. Um, but then because you know there's an odd number of vertices and you want that each vertex has an odd neighbor, it's like a parity counting thing and it, it's, it's unsatisfying. Yeah, and these formulas are have been really important in proof complexity. Um, they were one of the first formulas to be shown to be hard for resolution. Um, they're hard for AC zero frega. Uh, and yeah, they've just kind of been used all over the place. And um, it had been a long-standing conjecture that they uh, required exponential size uh, cutting planes proofs. Um, on the other hand, in this 2018 paper, we showed actually that there are, oops, that should not be cutting planes, that should be stabbing planes. That's, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Um, okay, so, so that there are quasi polynomial size stabbing planes proof of sign. So <laughs> this number may look big, it's, it's pretty small um, compared to exponential. Okay, so small stabbing planes proofs of sign. Um, so this, this seemed like a good separating example to us. Um, however, um, in 2020, uh, Dedush and Tuari actually showed that these quasi polynomial size stabbing planes proofs of sight can be translated into quasi polynomial size cutting planes. Okay, so, refuting this long standing conjecture. And <laughs> yeah, um, so th this approach didn't work. Okay. Uh, so, then maybe let's switch sides and ask like maybe can every stabbing planes proof be efficiently translated into cutting planes can we actually just simulate this branching that branch and cut is doing with these like cuts at the corners um so we answer this positively provided the coefficients are not too large uh so each each linear equality doesn't have like massive coefficients um i think quasi polynomial size coefficients are fine um no, okay. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the simulation of uh, between the two, it holds at quasi poly, but it's not known to hold at poly, is it? No, so that's a great open question. I would love somebody <laughs> to give me an answer to that. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm kind of agnostic on whether that's true. Um, yeah, okay, so, so our main theorem is the following. It's kind of a complicated statement, but it's it's basically saying that if, if the coefficients of a stabbing planes proof are, are not too large, like the coefficients of each inequality, then you can quasi polynomially turn any stabbing planes proof into cutting planes. Okay. Um, more formally, so if you have a polytope and there's a stabbing planes proof of size s, where each coefficient has magnitude c, um, then you get a cutting planes proof of this size where we have a dependence on the diameter of the polytope and i'll show you why that comes in it looks a little bit weird initially uh but um this is really where the uh yeah the, the, this diameter blow up uh is very related to this coefficient okay. um yeah and so we get a nice crawling from this so we get the first lower bounds on bounded coefficient stabbing planes proofs um by just applying the known lower bounds for cutting planes. Uh, so we get lower bounds for the clique color formulas um, and lower bounds for random uh, log and CNF formulas. So, so yeah. does this come from our paper then? Uh, well, because in, in our lower bound paper, we also, I mean, we called it deduction, you know, we were. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, so we had lower bounds for those two, right? Yeah, but that had to be a balanced yes. tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this this so can this be is... very, very unbalanced. Mm -hmm. This is allowing just an arbitrary uh, tree. So at the end of the day, it is it is a reduction just to interpolation. So it's it's interesting. That... This yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I I did this is where for non balanced, you know. Uh huh. So this is interesting. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, like this, the, the stabbing planes thing was originally came from me and Antonino looking at, uh, at your paper. So, <laughs> yeah. 
but but like with balance with the balance tree you can you can do some tricks on there but with the unbalanced thing it's it's really weird uh, so i'll try to sketch the proof yeah, uh, the diameter seems a little peculiar to me because uh, aren't there unimodular? I mean, your know, transformations, that, uh, linear transformation that take integers and in, in, integers that 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 greatly change the diameter. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, um, but I'm not sure if you can do these within stabbing planes. I think that's roughly the problem. You you'd need to represent that in the proof system. <clears throat> So, so I'll, I'll show you, <laughs> uh, I can show you the proof in a second. Um, Small question. So everything that you've done, uh, the, the uh, simulation and conjecture separation is between tree-like proofs and dag-like cutting planes proof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, uh, how is it, how is it, uh, is it reasonable to assume that uh, there is no separate that dag like cutting plane is not stronger than tree like stabbing plane. Uh, that they're actually equal? No, I just um, uh, surprised that dag like cutting plane is not stronger even than yeah. stabbing. Plane. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was like originally my intuition, but it's sort of this like top down versus bottom up. Like, I, I guess. Uh, an another way to think about this is that um, you can view stabbing planes as this tree-like RCP proof system, where every line is a disjunction of linear inequalities. So you're allowed a lot more line power and, and this uh, additional expressivity of, of lines is allowing you to simulate these like dag-like steps in cutting planes. Um, so it, that, uh, this is an equivalent of... Uh, uh, Krejcik's uh, resolution over cutting planes is equivalent to stubbing plane. Uh, the tree-like version. Tree-like. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The dag-like is not known. Probably not true. There's one more question. Well, so I mean, is there something known about about separations between cut? I mean, this is something I was working on way <laughs> back. You know, between. Uh, polynomial coefficients and exponential coefficients for cutting planes. Still a great yet, open problem. Right? <laughs> People because are still working on that today. That here, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, no, it's really interesting. And probably the same thing might be true because looking at your theorem, you know, the simulation preserves the coefficient size or no so no? it doesn't. So the really annoying, I would love it to do that. And I can talk a little bit at the end about like why it doesn't do that, but it turns, yeah, like low coefficient stabbing planes proofs into very high coefficient cutting planes proofs, so which is, is like, uh, uh, every coefficient at most C. Yeah, so I don't, I don't say the coefficients of the, of the resulting cutting planes oh. proof, but they do kind of recursively blow up. Um, oh. I'll say in, in a minute where that comes okay. in or, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll sketch the proof. Um, there's two steps. Uh, so we showed that cutting planes is equal to this path like stabbing planes, uh, but we're actually going to show it's equal to a uh, more general object that yeah, seems a lot stronger initially than path like stabbing planes. Uh, and then we'll show that any bounded coefficient stabbing planes proof can be made into this face like stabbing planes proof, this, this more powerful version, seemingly more powerful version of path like stabbing planes. Okay. Um, so a stabbing planes query one of these branches is, is face-like if at least one of the two polytopes you're left over with is a face of the, and the part of the polytope that you started with. Okay, so a face is just like one of the sides. So uh, it's, it's like a dimension you've lost in the dimension. Okay, so I can show it with a picture. Uh, it's probably a bit easier. So this is a path-like query. Uh, remember you shaved off basically a side of the polytope uh, and your, your proof was a big long tree. Uh, but a face-like query, like a path-like required that this side was completely empty. Uh, but a face-like one, you, you only require that, um, that this side is a face. So I may have points exactly along the half space that survive. Um, yeah, so, oh, yeah. I can repeat the question. Yeah. 
Um, for example, when you branch on a variable, the you know Boolean variable, then it's always going to be face like. Yeah, exactly. So so when you branch on a variable, this is what Russell is saying. If you branch on a variable, then it's always face like. Yeah. So you, you just want you have like a linear inequality, and you want the only points to survive that survive on one side are those that lie exactly on the linear inequality. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so a face like proof, yeah, can have you can actually recurse on both sides. It's not trivial on one side, like unlike a path like proof. Um, yeah. But the main the, the key observation is that in a face like Cray, at least one of the two children, the one that's the face, you drop in dimension by at least one. Let's say that one drops in dimension. Um, yeah. And so if we want to show that face like stabbing planes is equal to cutting planes, we will rely on this lemma by Shriver from the 80s, um, which basically says that if we have a cutting planes refutation of a face, then there's a way to lift it up to um, a derivation on the initial polytope. So if we have a face, so let's say that AX gray equal to B is valid for the polytope. So every point in the polytope lies on that lies to the right of like AX gray equal to B, or like satisfies AX gray equal to B. Um, so if we look at the face AX equal to B, that is we throw in AX less than B. Um, then if we have a refutation of this face, then we can derive that AX is actually, we, we can lift this refutation into a small derivation from the initial polytope that AX is gray equal to B plus one. So I can show you this in a picture. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah. So here's this is gonna be my face. Um, so I have a x grand with a b is valid for every point in the polytope. Every point satisfies it. And now I'm gonna look at the face a x equal to b. That is, I throw in the inequality a x less than or equal to b. Um, this is the face here. Um, and so. I'm going to suppose that I have a cutting planes refutation just of the face. So yeah, so we have a bunch of CG cuts here. That slowly rule out um, this face and eventually derive it. Okay. We have this refutation of the face, and then from it we can derive a refutation of the face starting from the initial polytope. We looked at this face. We lifted this refutation up. To a derivation of AX gray with a B plus one starting from this polytope P. The, the size of the derivation is going to be equal to the size of, of the refutation of the face. And so this, this, this is going to change the coefficients. And this is where this coefficient comes up. Uh, this coefficient blow up comes. So we have to. Basically, we take this refutation and we shift half spaces around to, uh, to use this lemma. Um, and we're going to rec recursively apply the lemma, and that's going to cause the coefficients to blow up a lot. Um, yeah, so now we want to show that face like stabbing planes is equal to cutting planes using this lemma. Uh, so we fix a face like stabbing planes proof. Uh, we take an in-order traversal and we repeatedly apply this lemma in order to lift um, refutations of faces up to derivations on the higher polytope, right? So at the leaf, this is just a ref, like a trivial sort of refutation of this polytope. The polytope's just empty. And we lift it up to derive, um, you know, maybe this is AX less than or equal to B. We derive AX grand to the B plus one. Now we're down here. We keep lifting it up. And we're slowly like unraveling this tree into a into a cutting planes proof. Okay. So, for example, P one is a face of P zero. Uh, P two is going to be a face of P one, and so on and so forth. So we just unravel this tree into a cutting planes proof. Um, yeah. And each of these recursive steps can blow up the coefficients. I don't see a way to bound it. Uh, and then the second step is we want to show that you can turn any low coefficient uh, stabbing planes proof into a face like stabbing planes proof. So remember, a face like stabbing planes proof is one where uh, one of the two sides of the, uh, of the query 
is just a face of the polytope. And, and this thing is, we just kind of do the dumbest thing possible. Okay, so we, we start with a, a query in the stabbing planes proof, AX less than equal to B, AX squared equal to B plus one, like this. Um, and we want to convert it to a face like query. And what we're just going to do is add a bunch of translates of this query until we hit a face. <laughs> so, so just like this, actually. I think these queries might actually be wrong. Um, so basically, this here is a face. We hit the edge of the polytope. Um, so we first query this thing. And then on one branch, we query this thing, so on and so forth. OK, so that's a face. Yeah. And we're going to ref recursively refute each of these translates using the old stabbing planes proof. right? So um, this one, this uh, branch here, this, this subproof here, completely ruled out all of the polytope over here. And so we can just apply it down here and refute uh, each of these uh, more refined branches. And then on the other side, we just use the, uh, the other subproof. Okay. So yeah, we just want to turn something into a face like Staten Plains proof. We, we have a branch, maybe it's not face like. What we're just going to do is we're going to start at like the nearest face of the polytope, but we're just going to add translates to work our way in. Um, <laughs> very, yeah. And the small coefficients are used to show that there aren't very many translates? Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, was, I was just about to say that. Yes. So, um, yeah, so the width, so if we want to add all these translates, um, I want to say that the number of translates that we're going to add to this polytope is going to be proportional to, it's obviously proportional to the width of this slab, but the width of this slab is like inverse, inversely related to the size of the coefficients. If you have really small coefficients, then this slab might be really small, but if, if the coefficients are large, the width of this slab is going to be pretty large. And so you're going to get, um, you're not going to need as many translates if the coefficients are different. So then you just recurse on each of these guys and you keep applying the same thing. And the recursive blow up that you get is going to be proportional to the width of the slab um, and also the diameter of the polytope because you're just going to, you have to cover one side of the polytope each time. Uh, so this brings me to kind of a weird property of these proofs that we get out of this. Okay, so we showed that these face like stabbing planes proofs are equal to cutting planes. Um, but what this theorem actually does is convert pretty shallow stabbing planes proofs. So like the tree doesn't have very long depth, large depth into very deep cutting planes proofs. And this happens because we're taking an in order traversal of the stabbing planes tree. We're just kind of going down each branch and it unrolls the thing into a very deep um, cutting planes proof. So for example, the, we have the stabbing planes proofs of Cyton. Um, these ones have size quasi polynomial and uh, polylogarithmic depth. Um, however, after applying this translation, this converts uh, the proof into a cutting planes proof that has both depth and size quasi polynomial. And this is weird because um, there, for any unsatisfiable CNF formula, there is a cutting planes proof that has maybe has exponential size, but has linear depth. So for every unsatisfiable CNF formula, we have a linear depth um, uh, cutting planes proof. So this is kind of a beyond worst case depth. Uh, these, these are very strange um, uh, proofs. Uh, and so we made this conjecture at the end of the paper, which is that any sub-exponential size cutting planes proof um, of the Cyton formulas has to actually have this beyond worst case depth, have to, has to have super polynomial depth or, or even polynomial depth, like super linear depth would be interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, and this would be like a really weird structure of these proofs. And um, <laughs> for those of you who are like me, Various that didn't realize that there was an upper bound for the Cyton formulas. This would maybe under explain why we didn't find this upper bound because it's making cutting planes behave in a way that seems extremely unnatural. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Okay, so I just want to say a few things on this conjecture. Um, yeah, so uh, basically any um, any CNF formula uh, has a linear depth proof, but it must it might have exponential size. Um, this brings you to like these supercritical size depth trade-offs. So this conjecture is about supercritical trade-offs. Um, in particular, uh, so a supercritical trade-off is one where you bound some measure of a proof and it causes another measure to go beyond worst case. So for example, in this conjecture here, I want to say that if I bound the size of cutting planes proofs of the Seiton formulas, it causes the depth to go way beyond the worst case linear upper bound. Um, so in complexity thus far, we, we don't really have many examples of these trade-offs. Um, the first few examples were for, um, there was a trade-off between, a supercritical trade-off between resolution, size, and space. There was also one by Razbarov that does a trade-off between tree-like resolution, size, and width. We're going to come back to this one. Um, and then there's been uh, several other ones between space and size and also width for resolution and polynomial calculus. But we don't really have many examples of this strange behavior of, of proofs. Um, so in, in a follow-up paper, uh, we proved the first supercritical size depth trade-offs. Um, uh, and these held for resolution, this KDNF resolution proof system, and also for cutting planes. So this is good if we want to prove this conjecture. Um, so I'm going to say a few words on that. So this builds on this proof by Razbrov in 2016. Um, actually, it can, it can be uh, viewed as a pretty simple extension of it. Um, and I'll, I'm going to say why we don't immediately get this conjecture from it and why it seems like this, resolving this conjecture might be a little bit more difficult. Um, so here's the statement of the theorem a little bit more formally. Um, so it's, it's a really nice kind of smooth trade-off. Um, so we can show that for each of these proof systems, I'll, I'll, I'll define it for a resolution here, and then the, the trade-offs for cutting planes and res-k are similar, but uh, basically the same. Uh, basically, there's a CNF formula. We have a parameter C um, such that there's resolution proofs of roughly n to the C uh, complexity. Um, however, if we want the size to be like roughly sub-exponential, um, then the depth times log of the size has to satisfy this relation here. So if we bound the size of the proof to be sort of sub-exponential, this turns out to like, like what happens is that this forces the depth of this proof also to be like roughly uh, like two to the end of the epsilon-ish. So we get like these proofs that are um, have you know, slightly sub-exponential size, but depth that's also basically sub exponential and, and so it's just like one long skinny path. These are behaving very strangely. Um, and I'm going to say a few words on the, the proof here uh, so you, that you can see why it doesn't resolve this conjecture and why I think some sort of new techniques are going to be required. Um, so the proof idea is pretty simple. Uh, we begin with a formula which has small size but requires large depth in resolution. Um, so, for example, the pebbling formulas, they have linear size, but require near linear depth. And then the whole idea is to just take this formula and sort of compress the number of variables while maintaining the hardness of the formula. So I'm going to shrink the number of variables from little n to capital N. Uh, capital N is going to be way smaller than little n. It's going to be approximately like n to the c for that uh, parameter c there. Uh, and we're going to maintain that the that there's an upper bound roughly in um, uh, order n, maybe uh, yeah, this is approximately order n, and a lower bound of n log n. Uh, but these are in terms of the initial variables, so the, the uncompressed variables. So we've just taken our formula, shrunk the number of variables, but maintained the trade-off, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, so we want to take n variables, compress it to capital N, which is going to be n to the one over C. Tiny number of variables uh, compared to the initial ones. And um, the, in order to do this, what we want is we want that it should be difficult for resolution to be able to differentiate between the um, original formula and this compressed formula. And so 
it can't really use uh, any information of, about the fact that we've really compressed it in order to solve this formula. Um, so how do we do this? Um, roughly, the idea is, uh, the way I like to think about it is we, we take the, the CNF formula F and we compose it with this pseudo random generator, this Nissan Vigerson generator. So um, more formally, that we replace, we, we look at a graph where the left variables are the initial variables, the right variables are the new variables, and we stick an expander on here. Um, and we replace each old variable with an XOR of its neighbors in the new variables. So for example, here, oh, I think this is, so X, this would be X6, is going to be replaced with the XOR of Y2 and Y3. And so basically what we can show after doing this is that resolution really can't differentiate between this new composed formula, this XORified formula, and the initial formula. And so we still basically get this, this depth lower bound. Um, however, uh, the number of variables has shrunk uh, by a massive factor. And so we get this huge trade-off. We just amplify this trade-off to a... Uh, uh, to something much larger. So um, then we can get the trade-offs for uh, KDNF resolution and cutting planes by a similar, uh, by, by just lifting the same technique, just using known lifting theorems. Uh, so, yep. Yeah. What does it mean to differentiate? Uh, very, uh, so uh, BJ's question is, what does it mean to differentiate? And uh, I mean that very, very informally. Um, like all I mean here is that resolution still requires like little n over log n um, uh, complexity in order, like size in order to refute this composed formula, even though this composed formula has been obfuscated and compressed in such a way that the, the number of variables has dropped. Uh, by a massive factor, like you can set C to be uh, something that depends on N. Okay. Um, yeah, so then the question is, can I use um, this supercritical trade-off um, approach in order to show that any cutting planes in order to resolve this conjecture. So show that any cutting planes proof of the site and formulas has to, that small has to have very, very large depth. Um, so it's not obvious to me that this would work because it fails basically at the first step. Um, so we start with a formula that is, in order to prove these supercritical trade-offs, we start with a formula that witnesses a small size depth trade-off for, um, uh, for resolution, right? Like the pebbling formulas, they had linear size proofs, but very large depth. And then we amplified this. However, the Seiton formulas are already extremely hard for resolution. They require exponential size resolution proofs and maximal depth. So we don't have this trade-off to amplify. So we can't do it by just lifting from resolution. Maybe this strategy could work, but it's you have, it seems like you have to implement it for cutting planes and that seems uh, challenging. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we need a, it seems like we need a more direct approach than starting with resolution, proving the trade-off there and using these lifting theorems to lift it up to stronger proof systems. Um, so the last thing I want to mention is that towards this, we tried to prove, uh, tried to maybe start progress uh, on this question um, by proving, a, uh, by developing a way to prove lower bounds on the depth of cutting planes proofs. Um, that is sort of like, uh, has a nice geometric flavor that we we're hopeful maybe could be extended to this. Um, and in doing that, um, yeah, we proved linear depth lower bounds on, on sign formulas, even for uh, semantic cutting planes. This extends this work by Burrish Oppenheim and all. And yeah, it uses a, a very simple um, geometric argument, which is kind of what we need in order to start analyzing cutting planes directly rather than these techniques that use more communication and it's not so clear that supercritical trade-offs will be as easy to obtain for those communication methods. Um, 
Uh, so that's the end of my talk. I just want to end with a couple of open problems. Uh, so first is to prove or disprove this conjecture. Um, then second, can we improve this um, simulation of stabbing planes by cutting planes to from um, low coefficients to high coefficients? I think this is a great question. I, I kind of waffle whether it's true or not, but I, I think it's probably, I, I hope it's true. I think that would be very cool. Um, or alternatively, prove a separation between the two. Um, uh, can we, uh, so th there's, a, there's a generalization of the stabbing planes proofs to a DAG-like model called ResCP, and can we prove a separation between stabbing planes and ResCP, or is this uh, e even for low coefficient <coughs> stabbing planes, or is there a simulation? I don't know. That seems unlikely. Um, so uh, there's this work by Albert um, who shows that I think it can be interpreted as saying that cutting planes cannot simulate res CP, maybe quasi polynomially. So there's this, uh, I think that people, they show a, a upper band for the color formulas. Um, in KDNF resolution, which can be implemented in ResCP. Um, and you know, the, the click color formulas are known to be hard for cutting points. Um, oh, and one other question that I wanted to ask and forgot to include here is like, uh, can we develop some sort of solver based on this stabbing plane system? Um, it seems, I mean, obviously choosing how to branch um, is difficult, but it, it's a very clean, uh, proof system, and it can directly simulate DPLL. It can do the same sort of branching that DPLL is doing. It's it's a very like branching based proof system. Um, yeah, can we can we generate some sort of uh, solver based on this uh, framework? Uh, thanks. Thank well, Noah will repeat the question, so I don't need to run around. So, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> So, in a way, this system, the stabbing planes, is a little bit like the, the proof system behind linear programming, right? Mm -hmm. So, in a way, wouldn't linear programming be like the implementation with all the, you know, your heuristics and everything of stabbing planes? Or you yeah. think there, there are other ways? Yeah, but I, I was I was hoping you could do some sort of like clause learning sort of analog for this. But these. I think that what? they mm -hmm. introduced some clause learning. I mean, the people in integer linear programming, okay. they put in a lot of things, you know, and I think okay, some okay. kind of clause learning is there too, but you know. Okay, okay, yeah. I don't know too, too much about it. Any other questions? Yeah, do you have any references I'd, I'd really like to hear? Yes, Russell. So, um, I think uh, a lot of ILP algorithms are actually like closely held industrial secrets. Mm -hmm. So, are we actually aware of what they're actually doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not all of them. Some of them. <laughs> I mean, there, there is concrete information about some of them. So in Oaxaca, a few years ago, there was a workshop and there was an, a guy that implemented integer linear pro, uh, programming. And uh, I talked to him and he gave a talk that is probably recorded, you know, so you can look in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd really like to see that. I mean, so there is <clears throat> one open source solver, Skip, in Berlin, which is not as good as the commercial closed source solvers. So this is a difference from the SAT community where I think it's fair to say that the academia solvers are, are really competitive. This is not the case in mixed integer linear programming, but Skip is pretty good. And, and in particular, also a number of people who are working on the closed source solvers happen to sit like exactly in the same buildings as the Skip people do and they talk and they collaborate. <laughs> so it's sort of, it's semi-known, I think what the ingredients are, but maybe like exactly the secret sauce, how they mm. combine it is not fully known. I just wonder uh, if people in this room know about sort of uh, 
benchmarks that separate IP from SAT solvers, because uh, w w when I, w you know, in, in my uh, section about SAT solvers, I, I had a hundred benchmark pr problems and I, and, and I, I took them to my, to my friends who do uh, 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 integer programming. And I said, how many of these are trivial for you? And, you know, and, and, and they, and well, I had one problem, which, which I, which, what was it called? Um, um, uh, uh, good, um, yeah, digital tomography and the, the IP solvers, uh, uh, you know, wiped me out. I couldn't solve these problems with SAT at all. Um, uh, uh, so about a, out of 100 problems, I think I think they did very well on on maybe seven of them, but I was glad to know that it wasn't 97. If you, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> I, I don't know of any benchmarks that separate, uh, like practical benchmarks. Uh, yeah, uh, the story that I know from uh, Kevin Layton Browns is that originally people, when US was running the broadband, uh, the reverse broadband auction, they originally tried to solve those instances with operation research methods and nothing worked. Apparently, and then uh, they were able to do a really good job as set solvers plus some heuristics on top. That the stories that I know of. I know of other people who have better stories. Some more comments or questions? Um, so, in SMT uh, world, there has been some work where uh, called cuts from proofs. Uh, where uh, they take the linear approximation, uh, use a LP solve, mm. like simplex method to solve and see if there is a, a, a solution. And when they don't find an integer solution, they try to produce an equality as a proof that uh, there, there, there was not an integer solution. And then they branch on that equality like x plus y equals one. Yeah. So are you aware of it? And it seems interestingly related to that. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I'm wondering like if they have done to integrate that kind of method, maybe stabbing planes can also be integrated in SMT yeah. solving. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but that sounds, that sounds very similar to, yeah. What you would do here, I guess, like you just you solve the LP either gives you a solution or it doesn't. If it doesn't, you get like a cut that removes some some feasible region. And you recurse on it. Um, I'm not. Yeah, I have to admit I, 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 I don't know much about the SMT literature. Yeah, uh, sounds... I don't know the exact details, but they uh, they do it some kind of uh, uh, normalization, find a mm. particular. Uh, normal form of the tableau of the simplex for uh, I think hard mind normal form and from that they can extract this uh, proof of unsatisfiable that uh, current how we can uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that sounds similar to yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you Time for one more question. If there are no more questions. Let's go to the coffee break before we thank uh, Noah again.